Okay, back again. Now, please note, we just did the uh, prisoner's dilemma. When I say equilibrium, it doesn't mean the best. As you can see in the matrix, the best for both is, are to stay quiet. That's two years, that's half the time. But the dominant strategy forces them to confess. So if they could cooperate, could collude, trust each other, then that would be the better position. But based on the fact that it's a non-competitive game, the dominant strategy will lead them away from their best outcome. So again, equilibrium position, the Nash equilibrium, is not, does not mean it's always the best overall position. It could be, but it doesn't mean it is. Again, if both Bob and Anna stay quiet, they would each receive the shortest prison sentence term in terms of uh, better than uh, four. And the dilemma is that neither one can be sure what the other one will do. Again, it's non-cooperative. And so Bob and Anna must do what's best for them, pick the dominant strategy. Uh, they will do that, and that's confessed, even though the best outcome will not be achieved. And this gives an idea of the decisions you have to make out there in business. So firms in an oligopoly structure, or even in monopolistic, if you have maybe uh, some, some, some closer competitors, uh, maybe uh, uh, ones locally, and so you have to be worried about, the, again, with what the, uh, your competitor is going to be doing. And uh, game theory is simply a way for companies to better analyze the decisions. And by the way, game theory is used in uh, court cases, used in negotiations, treaty negotiations. Anytime you have opposing players who are trying to achieve different results, different payout, payoffs, uh, game theory becomes quite useful. So game theory, is again, is, is in... Uh, political science, used in psychology, sociology, pretty much all the social sciences, uh, you have game theory and, and, and in business. So let's look at another example of competing airlines. We have two airlines, maybe flying from Palm Springs to Oakland. We have uh, Delta and we have Southwest. And again, they have two strategies. You can have the high fares, uh, $200 for these flights, in which case they both charge $200. Each would earn a profit of $400 million. And then if Delta charges 200 and Southwest undercuts them at 150, looks like Southwest would get a lot of customers, have $550 million in profit, and Delta earns 50. Likewise, if Delta is a low uh, fare carrier, higher uh, cuts their fare below Southwest, then the opposite, Delta earns uh, a higher profit, and Southwest earns a little bit of profit. And if each, each firm uh, charges 150, each would end up with $300 million of profit. This might be for the year. Seems kind of high. Anyway, I just made the numbers up. Uh, Delta's perspective, okay, if uh, Southwest, say, charges $200 for fare, then we're right here, and Delta has two choices, match it with 200 or price 150 and earn five and 550, earn more profit. Well, looks like South uh, Delta would charge 150. And then if Southwest would charge 150, then we're here. Delta can charge 200 and earn a small amount of profit, or match the 150 and charge and earn 300. So just like with uh, the prison's dilemma, Delta has a dominant strategy. No matter what Southwest um, is going to do, Delta is going to charge $150. Let's look at Southwest perspective. If Delta, Delta charges 200, then Southwest has two choices. They can charge 200 or they can charge 150. And 150 is shows a better res, a return than 200. And so Southwest charges 150. And if Delta Charge is 150. So now we're over here. Southwest has two choices. Best choice is 150. So again, uh, Delta has, uh, uh, sorry, South Southwest has dominant strategy, which is the same as Southwest. And so we're going to end up both charging 150. Now, is there a way for the players to change the game to increase their respective profits? And the answer is yes. They can cooperate, change the game. 
So change the game from a competitive game to a non-competitive game, or what's known as a cooperative game, and they can collude, form a cartel. So again, collusion is an agreement among two or more competitors to reduce competition, and they can do it different ways. They can fix prices, they can divide the market up, equal shares, uh, reduce output, refuse to advertise. Uh, if everyone refuses to advertise, it uh, lowers the cost. An example of that would be the lawyer profession. For a long time, uh, it was thought to be um, beneath the quality of the profession for lawyers to advertise. And that really was a way to reduce competition and everyone could save money by not having to advertise. Uh, along came Jacoby Myers in the 1970s, I think it was. They started advertising on TV. It shocked everyone, but they were simply being competitive. And that sort of changed the profession uh, forever. So again, when rivals uh, form such agreements, it's called a cartel. And now cartels are normally illegal in the United States, especially if it lessens competition quite a bit, substantially. Now really, to be illegal, uh, you have to show actually getting together, what's known as meeting of minds. So some kind of physical meeting, some kind of email, some kind of uh, conversation that'll be evidence of meeting of minds. Uh, sometimes uh, s some types of collusion are legal as long as there's been no meeting of minds. It's okay to act together as long as you don't meet to do it. There's no conspiracy. This is known as tacit collusion. You kind of look the other way, I guess. Uh, one is known as conscious parallelism. That's where firms adopt similar policies of any kind of communication. So you just come to a, just an understanding. Say you have a gas station across the street. You don't meet with each other, but you sort of just happen to charge the same prices. Or maybe on Tuesday, your competitor has a lower price, and on Wednesday, you get the lower price. You can also get known as price leadership. That's where someone drops their price or raises their price, and the other competitors follow. Normally, it'd be a price increase, maybe. Uh, and so maybe if you're Southwest, you would raise your price and see if the other airlines follow. If they do, everyone keeps their price high. And if the other airlines don't do it, maybe Southwest would drop their price later on. Now, all that kind of, kind of behavior is difficult to maintain. Firms have incentives to cheat because, again, if you raise your prices, I can keep my prices low and attract a lot of or, uh, I can attract a lot of customers. And so if I can drop my price without you knowing about it, then I, I, have, I have a strong incentive to do that. So I might give secret rebates. I might uh, have people paying cash. I might give them 10% off, something like that. And therefore, uh, you guys keep your prices up high, and I, I'm able to expand by, while uh, giving my customers uh, price cuts without uh, my competitors knowing about it. And cheating is also easier when there's a to hide when there's a number of rivals increases. So the more rivals you have, the harder it is for everyone to monitor, monitor everyone else's, and that leads to more cheating, and that can lead to eventually the cartel to fall apart. Another thing is also no legal way to keep me to uh, maintain uh, uh, higher prices. Uh, we can have an agreement where we all charge higher prices, but that's not enforceable in, in the courts. Pretty kind of anti-competitive agreement is not really enforceable. It could be a, it could be a contract. It could be legal. It could be a contract, notarized by lawyer. But again, if it lessens competition, the courts may not enforce it. Force it. So here we have another strategy of a cartel. This would be a cooperative game, and then we have two options again. It's really the same choices, but now it's cheat and don't cheat. And so if they're going to have collusion, they're all going to charge the high fare right here. And so if both don't cheat, they all agree to the charge the high fare. And then if Southwest cheats, that's the, uh, that's the outcome there. And here, if Southwest holds to the agreement and Delta cheats, we're going to be here. And if they both cheat, cheat we're going to be there. Now, as we just saw earlier, that based on the same payoffs here, this is the dominant strategy for Southwest, the $150 fare, and that's the dominant strategy for Delta. So they have a strong incentive to cheat. Both players do, and even though this is the better outcome here, it's, it's similar to the prisoner's dilemma. 
So if they can hold the agreement together, they each can charge $200 and earn, earn high, high, high affairs, high profits, based on the high fares. But again, they each has an incentive to cheat. And see, Southwest, they might think, if I can get away with it for maybe you know a couple years, I can increase my profit dramatically at Delta's expense. Maybe I can give uh, secret rebates again. I can give uh, special deals online. It's probably hard to do that without Delta fi figure, figuring it out. They're probably have a, I mean, it's a small airport, Palm Springs. They probably are side by side in the airport. It's, it's pretty much hard to, to hide the fact that you're uh, giving uh, lower fares. So I'll stop there and I'll come back for one more uh, part lecture for chapter 10.